loved it. I don't, I didn't really think about where it came from, probably in the same way that you didn't really think about where your food came from when you were a kid too. I don't remember exactly when I decided to stop eating shark's fin soup or when I asked my family to, but I do know it's because of the stories I read and the photos I saw and the videos I watched. And now as a storyteller, I'm trying to change minds too. This is a photo that I took in Sri Lanka not too long ago. This is my aunt. She, over there in the middle, that's my uncle. He's talking to my mom. And my aunt is showing me where she keeps her expensive dried seafood goods, uh, like fish bladder and manta ray gills. I had, I had no idea that she had these things. She started showing me other things she had. She had cow gallstone, which she takes when she feels headaches that are a remnant of a stroke she had a couple years ago. And to my surprise, she also showed me a small nub of rhino horn that a friend had given her many years ago for a thyroid problem. If you asked the English-speaking internet, they would probably tell you that she were stupid, ignorant, barbaric, a monster. But I know she's not those things. Chinese demand is causing a lot of animals to go extinct. But when we make generalizations about China, this vast, diverse country, it's not helpful. Even for me, I sometimes feel alienated or that I'm being talked about like I'm not there. As a visual storyteller, I've been exploring traditional Chinese medicine, its users, and where the ingredients come from. This photo is from a market in Guangzhou where you can see that the amount of wildlife being sold, in this case seahorses, is absolutely mind-boggling. I'm hoping that my photos can help spark an informed, nuanced, empathetic, compassionate conversation about what's going on. If we're going to solve the environmental crisis, we need to talk to people. We need to invite them to the table, and we need to involve them in our solutions. And we're going to need nuance and compassion and empathy. And that's why I'm so excited about our panel today, because that's exactly what it's about. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dominique Gonzalez. She's an ecologist working at Gorongosa National Park, and she's a National Geographic Fellow. Thank you. Oops, not yet. <laughs> As a Mozambican woman, it's a great honor to be here and to represent my colleagues in Gorongosa National Park. Gorongosa is known to some of you as a wildlife restoration success story. In the last decade, our large population, animal population, increased from 10,000 to 100,000. But, thank you. <laughs> but Gorongosa isn't only about restoring wildlife. It is also about restoring people's life. When we see our park in a greater landscape and we think about the challenges we face today, we also think about what can we do to ensure that people and wildlife has a, have a healthy and safe future. These are some of the reasons why Gorongos is being successful. First, management. Gorongosa is co-managed in a 35-year private-public par partnership between the government of Mozambique and the Greg Carr Foundation. This partnership gives us a lot of independence and flexibility. We can try new things and we can adapt quickly when we see that one idea don't work. Second, conservation and science. Gorongosa face has many other wild places in Africa and around the world, many threats. But we have been holding the line. Our rangers reduced po poaching by 72%, and they kept the worst of the illegal wildlife trade at our door. So protection is critical. But you can't protect what you don't know you, don't, you have. So we're constantly documenting and monitoring our biodiversity. We want to, we want to know our animals and plant species. We want to understand their relationships and, how, and what benefits they give us. This is what we do at the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Laboratory in Gorongosa. 
A month ago, we celebrated in recording our 6,000 species, and it's already going more and more. Third, benefits. Simply put, a national park is an opportunity to cost to local people. The people can live, farm, or hunt there. And sometimes, the elephants that I study go to their farms and raid their crops. So you have to pay the opportunity cost back to people and give benefits. We provide decent jobs to 650 people, but not everyone can have a job. So we work with the government to deliver health care to people, agricultural assistance to families, and education support, especially for, to, for vulnerable girls. We believe that when we give enough benefits, people listen. And if you listen back, you'll become partners. Fourth, funding. Of course, providing all these benefits is expensive. National parks are often underfunded. So we, part we look for partnerships with organizations, groups that normally don't do conservation, but they focus on human development. These groups want a reliable partner. We have the staff, we have the infrastructure, we know the place, we have strong relationships with the people, with our communities. So it becomes a win-win for everyone. But we don't want to rely on donors forever. We're starting now to think of sustainable financing funding sources. We're growing shade-grown coffee and Mount Goyongoza. It not only helps funding the park programs, but also gives income to the local farmer and helps protect the rainforest at the mountain. Lastly, think long term. You know, we, as I said, we are long term, 35 years. This way, the people know that you're not ju there just one day and gone the next. They engage, they trust you. And you also have to think about climate change. This was brought to home to us on the 9th of March 14th, when Cyclone Idai smashed into Mozambique, taking more than a thousand lives, destroying most of my home city of Beira and local communities around Gorongosa. During the cyclone, the park absorbed 800,000 you know, Olympic-sized swimming pools of water. Overnight, our entire staff became relief workers. Since then, we, de we have delivered 390 tons of food over to 79,000 people. We're now starting to give seeds to farmers to regrow their lost crops. We are now starting a multi-year effort to rebuild the schools, the clinics, the roads, the homes. So you can't just think small anymore. For us, it's more than just protecting a conservation area now. We have to, to, to think more than our borders and see our place in the greater landscape. Because after all, all we want is also long-term coexistence and balance. And I believe that educating girls will take us there. The reason... <laughs> Thank you. The reason I'm standing here today is because of Gorongosa efforts to change gender norms and elevate Mozambican women. If you teach girls or women if you teach women, engage women, and empower women, we will, our, I mean, our potential will be unleashed. We will lift up our communities, and we will protect these wild places we all depend on for a healthy, safe future. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you. Next up, we have the director for Latin America for National Geographic's Pristine Seas Project, Alex Munoz.
thank you. How do you imagine a pristine sea looks like? Just all of us take a moment and let's get a picture of a pristine sea in our heads. Do you have it? Well, this is the picture of a, of a pristine sea that I have in my head. For me, it looks like a watch, the inside of a watch. You have big wheels, you have middle size, you have smaller wheels. And although they are all different, they all make sense together. And they enable this watch to give us the exact time. If you add a wheel or if you lose one, this watch will be broken. It will never tell us the exact time anymore. Let me show you a picture of this watch in the wild ocean. This is Mexico, the Reviajijedo Islands. A few years ago, we went on a pristine seas expedition to these islands, and we found this incredibly healthy ecosystem with all the right parts. You have the big fish, the sharks, the mantas, the smaller fish, the algae, and let alone diving there. What an unbelievable experience was to dive with those giant mantas that thrive in that place. And now let me tell you about a luxury watch in another place in the south. Just imagine a brand of a luxury watch. <laughs> Let me tell you about Cape Horn in the south of Chile. A few years ago, we went again on an unbelievable expedition of pristine seas to the south. And in Cape Horn, we were diving in this kelp forest. And with my friend and colleague, Pelayo Salinas, we were going down this kelp forest. And suddenly, we saw that the floor was moving. It was very strange. And then we got closer and closer and deeper, and we saw these thousands and thousands of crabs and dozens of different species eating each other in this phenomenal ecosystem, a pristine and intact ecosystem. This is how the oceans should be like. But is this the image that we usually see in today's oceans? Unfortunately not. This is bottom trawling, one of the most evil inventions of humankind. This is how they are fishing hake very near Cape Horn in my country, Chile. This is a, uh, sorry, a coral reef that must be a thousand years old that was cut by one of these trawlers. And in the north of my country, the fishing vessels that were fishing anchoveta saw these dolphins feeding in this place and they decided to throw this, their nets anyway. All these dolphins died. And very near there, only two months ago, they found this dead dolphin that was a victim of fishing with dynamite. And you know the story of the vaquita in Mexico, the most threatened marine um, mammal in the world. Some scientists anticipate that this uh, species will be extinct this year because of the bad fishing practices and ineffective conservation efforts. So the oceans are in big trouble, and we have one more chance to save them. Enrique Sala, National Geographic Explorers, Explorer, created Pristine Seas 10 years ago, and we have an amazing team from different fields and countries that most of them are here in this audience. And we have one goal in mind, protecting the last wild places in the world's oceans. And the way we do that is by creating large marine reserves that, that not only protect the rich biodiversity, but also uh, they bring the fish back, they bring jobs back, and they feed people, and they make these marine ecosystems more resilient to climate change. So it's a pretty good solution if you think about it. Hmm? Sometimes I get the question, what's the right approach for doing that? Is that a top-down approach? Do you just shake hands with the president and then just order the creation of a marine reserve? Or a bottom-up approach? Do you work with a local community and then wait until the rest of the society understands their proposal? Actually, we think that it's both at the same time. We work with different actors, different groups that usually are in opposite sides of the street, opposite sides of a debate, and just make them be aware of the facts, scientific facts, and make them listen to each other so they can build a common solution together. This is uh, Juan Fernandez fishing community. Juan Fernandez is an archipelago in Chile, 
and it's one of the most environmentally advanced communities I've ever met. In the 1930s, they already figured out the way to manage their lobster fishery, which is today one of the most sustainable fisheries in the world. And we worked with them with, uh, for many years, and they understood the facts, the science that we brought, and they proposed the creation of the two largest marine uh, reserves in Chile. And we have worked with many communities and indigenous peoples in, in different parts of Latin America to do the same. Also, we work with scientists from our team and local scientists that usually know more about the place than us. And we work together and they perform these great explorations um, to build the scientific support for these proposals. And we use technology like this amazing submarine or the drop cameras that, was, that were invented by National Geographic and that uh, enabled us to know the seafloor and the, sea, the, the deep sea like never before. And we uh, put together these amazing documentaries. And these are so important because, unfortunately, information doesn't move the world. Emotions move the world. And when people see our shows, they just f fall in love with this place. Presidents, communities, everyone want to protect these places once they see our shows. Recently, we have incorporated a new, a new tool, satellite images. And we have Juan Mayorga here that does this amazing um, analysis to estimate the economic impacts of uh, closing an area. And we work with visionary leaders like former president of Chile, Michel Bachelet, that was brave enough to create three large marine reserves that are the largest in Latin America. So is this enough? No, we're going even further. This is something we should be very proud of. Chile and Argentina, two different countries working with National Geographic together on a joint expedition to Antarctic Peninsula. Just Remember that both countries almost went to war 40 years ago because of a territorial dispute. And now they're working together for science and marine conservation, and they have jointly proposed the conservation and protection of Antarctic Peninsula. That's really outstanding in terms of the relationship that we're building. So what has been the result of this? In a period of eight years, Chile went from almost zero to 24% of its waters protected, creating four marine parks fully protected, uh, covering nearly one million square kilometers of ocean. Mexico created a, the largest marine reserve in North America, 150,000 square kilometers protected in the Revia Jijeo Islands. Argentina just created two reserves, jumping from two to 9% of its waters protected, adding 100,000 square kilometers of ocean protected. Ecuador created the first large marine sanctuary in the Darwin and Wolf Islands in the Galapagos Islands, which is the sharkiest place on Earth. Colombia expanded its marine park from 7,000 to 27,000 square kilometers that is fully protected. So that's what has been done in Latin America. In total, 11 big marine reserves, seven of them in the last few years, and um, our impact has been even global. We have done 30 expeditions. We have helped create 21 marine reserves covering over 5 million square kilometers of ocean that today are totally protected. <laughs> mm. yeah. Of course, we didn't do this alone. Nobody can. Not National Geographic, not a country not an NGO, not a group of scientists. We have to work all together and be very smart and strategic about this. And don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that we don't see our differences and, and, and tell everybody what we think about the problems. We have a responsibility to tell the world what those problems are. We have to be faithful to the truth. But the house is on fire. And at the end of the day, we only have each other to put that fire out. We have to work together. That's why we have decided to throw a more ambitious project. National Geographic, together with the Waste Foundation, have launched the last wild places and the campaign for future to protect 30% of the planet. And we need to keep working together. We need each one of you in this room and everybody outside this room to be involved. Your support and your engagement really matters. Thank you.
Thank you, Alex. Our final speaker is an ecologist working for the American Prairie Reserve and a National Geographic Fellow. Please welcome Ray Wynn Grant. Thank you. I grew up in big cities. And it wasn't until I was 20 years old, a young adult, that I had my first experience in nature. I went on my first hike, I pitched my first tent, and I saw my first wild animal. And without a doubt, it changed my life. Because ever since then, I have dedicated my life and my career to the study of carnivore ecology, mainly African lions, and now I'm no National Geographic photographer, so these are my own pictures of lions I collared, <laughs> and black bears in North America. And when it comes to bears, some people view them as vicious, ferocious animals that have something against us. But through my work, I've come to view them as <laughs> quiet, dignified ecosystem engineers that have a lot in common with people. We like to eat the same foods. Fortunately or unfortunately, we like to live in the same places. We're concerned about raising our offspring in safe, nurturing environments. And we all like to sleep a whole lot. <laughs> and when it comes to bears, like many carnivores all over the world, some of the biggest conservation challenges surround their interactions with people. And that has informed a lot of my work and focused it in many ways. So my ecology work on carnivores largely surrounds those populations at the human wildland interface, or at the spaces where people and wild animals overlap. And it's this expertise that helped to develop my fellowship with the American Prairie Reserve. APR is on a mission to create the largest protected area in the continental United States. Located in eastern central Montana, APR is working to rewild part of the American Great Plains. And at the same time, to work with cattle ranching communities to create wildlife friendly ranching practices, something virtually unheard of in many parts of the world. APR is also on a mission to diversify local economies to support people and give communities a very bright future. And most importantly to me, we're working together to solve human wildlife conflict problems and even prevent them before they start. Now, a fully restored <coughs> ecosystem in the American Great Plains requires the conservation of grizzly bears and other threatened species in the ecosystem. These bears in particular are my focus area right now. And as part of a conservation success story in the United States, they have been growing in population size and migrating out of protected areas like Yellowstone and Glacier National Park faster than many of us thought was possible. They are quite literally walking over to their historic habitat in the prairie. And as a conservationist, this makes me very excited. However, there are a lot of people who aren't as excited. And the American Prairie Reserve and me and my colleagues, along with state wildlife agencies, small and large NGOs, local stakeholders, and entire communities are coming together and working together to answer a lot of questions that are arising and to create really effective action plans to make sure that we are protecting wildlife where there are people and protecting people where there are wildlife. 
And so these three protected areas that will that are or will be strongholds for grizzly bears and other wildlife are very, very important. And one of the most important things is that there's some type of connectivity between the three. Dispersal isn't effective unless, I'm sorry, conservation isn't effective unless there's some type of sustained, safe dispersal. I am particularly interested in corridors that might be found between these three areas. Those three strongholds create essentially a triangle. And we believe that with safe corridors for wildlife, as well as stepping stones of high quality wildlife habitat, we can maintain effective dispersal of individual bears, as well as genetic material between these three protected areas. This will lead to conservation success and ultimately the persistence of populations of grizzly bears and many threatened wildlife species in Montana. And so I did some work to fuse technical science with field work, with basic bear biology. And I collected a lot of information about the landscape, everything from tree and forest cover to waterways and things about the human landscape, like the distribution of roads and highways, human population density, cities and towns. Coupling those things that represent the landscape with basic science about bears and carnivores, their pure biology. And I used this information in a statistical framework that uses circuit theory from electrical engineering to make predictions about how the landscape looks to an animal. What are the most resistant parts of the landscape to move through? And what are the most accessible or least resistant parts of the landscape that an animal might move through? And the most important thing about conservation statistics, of course, is data visualization. Nobody wants to look at a lot of numbers. And so I used um, Esri mapping software to make these results into maps that we can look at. And the maps show the easiest spaces that bears might use to leave Yellowstone and Glacier and recolonize their historic habitat on the American prairie. That's what you see in this image, the outline of the state of Montana and these beautiful white lines that, if you focus on the center of the image, create that triangle once again. It's proof of concept. We knew it from our local understanding of the landscape, and now we knew it through a very rigorous statistical design. It's there. These pathways are possible. And using this type of statistical framework and all these different knowledge sources allow us to even ask further questions. What if we overlaid some of those pathways with human land use variables? Let's try one that's really important to bears, like agriculture and ranching. If we put the locations of agriculture and ranching landscapes onto this image, it might look something like this. And all of a sudden, that beautiful triangle of potential pathways for bears to disperse between protected areas is slightly obscured. And this isn't new information. Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and many of the stakeholders and collaborators we work with have been addressing what to do in these spaces. But in particular, myself and my colleagues at APR are interested in those red and green dots that you see around the American Prairie Reserve. Grizzly bears are on their way to our space, but they're not there yet. And it gives us a tremendous opportunity to go into the communities that we think will be most affected by wildlife and prevent conflict before it starts. We're bringing our ideas with us, and we're sitting and we're listening to what people have to say about the land that they have owned for generations. And so the next step of my work is to iterate the statistical modeling approach and involve the community even more than before to get to the real stuff, attitudes, tolerance levels, belief systems, and include that in an actual statistical framework to make further predictions and to do a better job at addressing people's needs and wildlife needs on this landscape. And so no matter if I am being hands-on with animals or if I am analyzing their landscape from a distance, 
I am very concerned with making sure that science is addressing the needs of people because the community is the future of wildlife conservation. And what I've learned through my fellowship thus far with National Geographic and the American Prairie Reserve is that there is this beautiful balance between technical, rigorous science and heart and soul and a compassionate listening ear. Thank you. Thank you. So my first question to you is, what is it like to hold a baby bear? I love getting this question, Laurel. <laughs> um, and baby bears always steal the show. So I usually like to have the attention and then pull out a bear cub and no one's looking at me anymore. Um, but a lot of folks don't know that bears and dogs have a common ancestor. And so little baby bears are a whole lot like little puppies. And so when you pull them out of their den for scientific work only, of course, um, they're really cold. And so they want to snuggle. And you just have to put them in your jacket. And they like to lick your neck a little bit. And it really, it couldn't be cuter. I could talk about baby bears for a long time. But I'm going to invite the rest of our speakers back on stage. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for your very insightful talks. So all of the stories you shared were pretty positive. It was about working with people. The people are happy. The animal's happy. We're all happy. But I'm sure it's not actually that simple, right? Can you talk about some of the challenges you've had in your work? Would you like to start, Dominique? Because um, challenges. I think we can talk about it a lot all afternoon. Um, if I say challenge for me as a young woman working uh, in the communities in Gorongosa, the first thing is I'll say my size apparently counts a lot because people, um, especially in the communities, first question is how old are you? But uh, then when we pass that, of course, there's a, there's a lot of healing still to be done for the people, especially in Africa, I would say, to the people who live near protected areas. There's a lot of work so people start to understand more about the value of having it instead of not looking at it as a, as a cost. So for me, being in the field, for example, talking to communities, is always about how I present myself and how I respect the traditions. And I do, and um, the most fascinating things is seeing other girls and women and general people in the community just looking at me fascinated because I'm wearing pants. Um, <laughs> yes, but then after that is also, they also look even more surprised when they see that I know the traditions and I follow it. And it's very genuine because it's, they're also my traditions. So. Thank you. What about you guys? Well, in, in our case, um, the, the greed of the commercial fleet is really uh, immense, and we have to um, deal with that every day. Um, um, the fishing industry um, today fishes in 95% of the world's oceans, and every time that we want to protect the place, <clears throat> they are there with their lobby, and they get to the governments, and they make phone calls, uh, so, we, so they try to stop us uh, every single time. And um, if, there, if it was for them, they would fish everything out. I mean, they just don't care about sustainable fishing. Um, so there's a big pressure, like political pressure and power, to stop us from achieving our goal. So um, imagine how it's going to be in the next years when we want to protect 30%. We are very aware of that. Uh, and that's why we will have to be more effective and smarter than ever if we want to win. Yeah, and I could talk about challenges. Of course, all of us as conservation scientists can. Um, but one main one is, you know, we're in the business of restoration. And uh, the landscape where I'm working with the American Prairie Reserve, um, the wildlife were extirpated from that landscape deliberately, right? It wasn't an accident that we have local extinctions and that we're trying to rebuild a wildlife community. And so along with this goal of rewilding comes a lot of misunderstanding and um, a lot of uh, kind of cultural differences. So for many people on the landscape, 
um, cattle ranching or agricultural production means something very deep in an identity way. And I may see, as a scientist, lives in the East Coast, has a lot of education and can do the modeling and create some proof, I might see a lot of potential in a landscape. But what's most important is understanding where people's hearts are. And that's a challenge for both of us on both sides, um, for us to all realize that we have the same goals. We want to see people thrive, and we want to see wildlife thrive without any feelings of disrespect or malintent. So I found that, you know, I find math and science and statistics really challenging. Um, but even more than that, it's just getting to the heart of things with people and building trust. So speaking of where people's hearts are, Dominique, you talked about how you're almost incentivizing people to support the park by offering benefits like health care and education. And Alex, you talked about how hard it is to get people to care. So my question is, is there a difference between incentivizing people to support something and to getting, and to getting them to care? And does the difference matter when, if it maybe it leads to the same result, or maybe it doesn't? Well, I'll say in and around going goes that people do care. You know, this is, the place is not just uh, something that someone brought and put in there. It's, it's always been there. There's deep connection between the people and the environment, the forest, the wildlife. As I always say, it's part of our, you know, uh, our beliefs, our totem. But as I said again, it's this need for healing. So not only incentives, but benefits actually is provide decent benefits that you know helps not only for people to I wouldn't say care because they do care to support but really create a virtuous cycle because if we talk about a benefit as education it's not something that you receive today and it's over in a month or so it's something that builds up and we will only see the return of that in maybe five ten years so that's where I stand. It's not just incentives. It's really uh, real opportunities in life that that will create a virtuous cycle for us. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> well, in my, in my experience, uh, it's very important that people feel some ownership of, um, of the marine reserves that we propose. Uh, uh, I really don't think that um, there's, there can be like an external force or maybe a, just a top-down approach where pe people just order things and then the rest follows. Um, in our case, and I think this is going to be even uh, stronger in the future, we have to make people participate, very actively participate, and you have to listen to them and you have to incorporate many of their visions so the final solution represents a whole. Of course, we cannot um, satisfy everybody because some people may say you know everything should be open to fishing and that's not what we want we have to explain very clearly the facts and the science and what are the impacts of, of each option uh, and then be persuasive so everybody's on board of one single solution and we believe that um, marine reserves when they are fully protected and they are well located they can satisfy things in a way that everybody wins like fishermen, for example, they, when they oppose to these reserves, sometimes they, or most of the time, they realize that if they protect one place, then they will be able to fish more outside the reserve, and um, and so on. So everybody has to understand what they're sharing, how they can win, and then they feel actively involved and be actually proud of the reserve that is finally created. What do you think, Ray? Yeah, well, I have a great story to tell, and I'm so excited to tell it. Um, and it's about my first trip uh, to Montana, to the American Prairie Reserve, for the beginning of my fellowship. And there was a big dinner that was created up on the reserve, um, which is really hard to access. And it was for ranchers. So it was a big dinner um, just for cattle ranchers on the American Prairie Reserve. And one of them stood up and said, it is against every value and principle that I have 
to be here and to be a fan of APR, but I am. And the reason was that this individual and their family had tried out some of the American Prairie Reserve's wildlife friendly ranching techniques. And APR has created a whole program called Wild Sky Ranching, and it incentivizes ranchers to adopt some environmentally friendly procedures and in turn get some extra funding on their ranch and the trade-off is that they're doing something great for the environment, in particular for large mammals. So for black bears, for mountain lions, for some of the larger bodied mammals that are there already. And this person is making more money than they were before and also facilitating uh, the restoration of the prairie. And they didn't want to like it, you know? And so it's exactly what you said, where an incentive for an individual actually was able to change their action and their dedication um, to a cause. And it's a wonderful model that APR has developed that I'm trying to just shout from the rooftops. And we're hoping that it can serve as a model for other um, organizations within the Last Wild Places Initiative. Earlier, Dominique, you talked about how when you go into these communities, they're surprised by the fact that you know the culture because it's your culture too. And on the other hand, you've also talked about how you've, you work with people that you might completely disagree with or you might not understand or might not understand you. So what's it, is it important to have locals working in conservation? And if you're not a local, how do you bridge those differences? Dominique, do you want to start? Of course, it's important <laughs> to have locals. Um, as I said, I'm here and I'm from there. I know the tradition. I didn't just learn to be able to do the work, but I grew up following those traditions, which make it very genuine. But it is important also that others, when they come, they follow it because people need to feel respected. People want to feel heard. And when that happens, they open many, many doors. Uh, one of the things that happened was, as I also work with human and uh, wildlife coexistence, I like to be optimistic. Um, when I, I, the first times I went there was just a lot of, you know, a lot of trauma, a lot of just hunger. But I start to just listen, listen more and follow the traditions more. For example, instead of just wearing go there wearing my pants, I would put my traditional clothes. And they start to see that actually she meant it, you know, she she knows what she's doing. She's part of us. So it became the the last thing, it became that it's not anymore your elephants, our farms. It's our elephants in our landscape. So this is the big change that it takes time. So Wherever, if you're from there or not, take time and invest in listening and learning and really just paying that tribute to the local people because they the, they're going to be the ones who are going to really yeah. doing the thing on the ground. Yeah, and as you can imagine, I'm the opposite of Dominique in a lot of ways where I am quite non-traditional in the landscape where I work um, in terms of identity. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it's um, something that I'm constantly learning is how to be effective with my identity and my presence in the space. I know everything about bears. I know everything about them. Um, I don't know everything about Montana. And that's really important. I can't pretend that I do. And so coming with humility um, and with sincerity and authenticity is important. And one cool thing is intersectionality, just as an individual. You know, I am who I am, but there are things that I have in common with some of the folks that I'll be working with or some of the people that I hope to, you know, come into cooperation with. Whether it's, you know, we're both interested in a certain type of outdoor activity. Um, I'm a mother, and there are lots of mothers in Montana, and so that has been a really great entryway into just getting people to build trust and to just find some common ground in order to start those hard conversations. Alex, what have your experiences been? No, working with the local communities and especially indigenous people is fundamental. It's all about a very sincere connection with them. Uh, you have to work with them in a very authentic way. This is not about just bringing a manual and try to uh, apply a formula. This has to be 
tailor-made, and you have to build that trust. And that means being with them in the good and the bad times. Uh, in Juan Fernandez, for example, uh, Juan Fernandez Islands in Chile, I worked with them for 10 years. And the, the change in the relationship I had with them had nothing to do with marine conservation. They were hit by a tsunami, and they lost half of the town. And they, a lot of people were, uh, died in that tragic event. And I decided to stop my work, my campaign, uh, and raise some funds with the organization I used to work for, uh, Oceana. And uh, we launched a big effort to hire all the local divers to get all the marine debris from the water so we can start rebuilding that place. Then they said, OK, now we can work together. Finally, after eight years, we created the Juan Fernandez Marine Reserve and the Desventuras Reserve that add 600,000 square kilometers of ocean protected. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I want to thank you so much for everything you've shared. And can we please give them one last round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Dominic, Ray, Alex. Do you all realize that every half an hour, we are taking you on a journey across the planet, from Gorongosa to Montana? Well, a moment ago after I introduced the VR uh, session, I realized that I forgot uh, to mention two very important people. The folks right here at National Geographic, Jenna Pirog and Kate Mullen, who actually took all of that rubbish footage I had shot and actually made that program for you. So thank you to them if they're watching it on live stream. Now, with VR, it might be limited to these goggles here, uh, these headsets. But National Geographic Channel, that all of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with, reaches 173 countries, 172 countries, and is transmitted in 43 languages worldwide. The next group of speakers are responsible for the content on this channel. I'm thrilled to introduce Chris Albert, Executive Vice President, Global Communications and Talent Re Relations for National Geographic Partners. Let's welcome Chris and his panelists. Welcome. All right, how's everybody doing this afternoon? I am super excited about this panel. You know, to put it simply, it is about storytelling and how we at Partners specifically bring the natural world to life for our audiences all over the world with some of the best filmmakers and storytellers in the world, like the ones sitting next to me. I'm thrilled to introduce, introduce Vanessa Berlowitz, Martha Holmes, and Chris Riley. I'm not going to read their bios because there's nothing worse than a moderator reading bios, but I am going to ask you guys each a question. And if you can give us a little bit of your background uh, as you answer my first question, that would be great. And one of my favorite questions to ask everyone who is here this week is about their passion, their passion for what they do. So I would love to understand and have you explain to us where your passion for storytelling comes from. You want to start, Vanessa? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a great honor to be in these fantastic buildings and meet you all. Um, my passion for storytelling probably started as a kid um, with my mother, who I think probably if she'd had her time again would have been a film director. But she weaned me on to American cinema really early. So whilst my friends were watching Thomas the Tank Engine, I was being shown things like Papillon, Midnight Cowboy, Raging Bull, <laughs> Taxi Driver, um, The Godfather as I got a bit older, and then Blade Runner. And, How and old actually, were you when you were watching Raging Bull? <laughs> <laughs> too young, too young. So she was getting bootleg coffees. I don't know how she had friends in the industry. but So I, I, that's how I got my passion. It was like these were great character studies and amazing storytellers. And tell us a little bit about what you're, where you're working now, what you do now. Sure. So um, I'm very lucky. I've started a, a company with my husband and a production company in Bristol, which is the mecca of wildlife filmmaking. Uh, well, it has been for 
for, for many of us. And um, we are currently producing two series for uh, National Geographic, very honoured to do so, America and Queens, and a couple of uh, feature-length documentaries on wildlife for Disney. Um, prior to that, I had many long years working at the BBC and worked on series like Planet Earth, Frozen Planet, Planet Earth 2, and many other um, hours, single hours of, of television. We're very excited about the shows you're working on for us, so we'll get to those in a second. But Martha, I'd love to s hear about your passion for storytelling. Uh, I had a very different experience <laughs> to Vanessa. So I was animals first and foremost in the outside world. So I was brought up on the shores of uh, Middle East and Africa. So the sea was my playground. And I loved escaping the stories as we all do, I'm sure, dramas and so forth. And I never really thought about the two marrying together. So I chased my ambition to work outside with animals. And I tried being an academic. I'm sure a lot of you are academics. And it just didn't work for me because I wasn't clever enough. And um, I just didn't feel that my, any artistic side in me was coming out. And I hated the data crunching. And I just wanted to be outside more. So then I looked into television. And then I, all I thought, I just, I'll just have a nice time being outside with animals. Thank you very much. I wasn't very imaginative. And then as your life um, builds, I'm sure you have had this experience, you get layers and layers of interest as you mature and grow and find new things. And I just, so I, I went into the business just wanting to be outside filming. And then the storytelling almost eclipsed that. So now my, I, my absolute love is being in the cutting room crafting the stories when people come back from the field with the footage. So I would say it's a, it's a latter thing. I grew up on films and loved it, but I never thought my love of wildlife would marry that. And luckily, they have. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm really blessed to be in the cutting room crafting stories and trying to give the audience the best story we can possibly give them. And can you tell us a little bit about where you are today? Yeah. So I am head of natural history at a company called Plimsoll Productions. Um, it's not an entirely wildlife uh, company. We do all sorts of, we call it fact and you call it reality shows, I think, and science docs and all that sort of stuff. So we have a broad range, but a large chunk of it is natural history. And like Vanessa, I had a history 25 years in the BBC for my sins. Um, <laughs> but it's a very, very, very good learning school. And you can, you, you know, you, you start at the very bottom and you learn everything and then you can decide what, if you want to specialize, what you specialize in. So I was very lucky to have that as my hinterland. Chris? Well, I was um, about two years old when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon almost uh, 50 years ago, coming up this summer. Um, and by the time I was five, people were routinely living and working on the moon, driving electric cars deep into the mountains there. Um, three people even went there twice. It seemed like a really kind of regular thing, um, an extension of you know, our human exploration. And by the time I was about eight, there were robotic probes landing on Mars and Venus and sending back pictures. I had them all over my bedroom wall. And I guess it's hard to think of a bigger, more exciting story that captures you as, as a child at that age. Um, and then Star Wars came out in 1977. I was 10. And what George Lucas had managed to do in terms of visualizing exoplanets almost 20 years before they were actually discovered um, blew me away. I mean, I still get sort of shivers down my spine when I remember sitting in a dark room like this and those curtains would move slightly wider on this screen and then on would come the kind of edge of this exoplanet there. Um, and so it was really um, a passion for planetary science that I was sort of injected into there through that storytelling, I guess. And then there was a really seminal edition of National Geographic magazine I've never told anyone this story, actually, and it's perhaps the best place to perhaps tell people for the first time. The January 1985 edition, and it's, it's on the board just outside those doors there. It's got Coco the Gorilla on the front cover. It had the most fantastic article on um, the planetary geologists that were exploring the solar system, the moons of Jupiter, and a little bit about what we knew about the moons of Saturn at that time. It's all over this article. And that was a seminal year for me because I was deciding what to go and study at university. And I went straight into, into applied geology and planetary science after that article came out. And I kept it. I read it dozens and dozens of times over the next few years. It was really life changing for me. And I went into science after that, um, thinking I was sort of brainy enough to perhaps do that. And what a mistake that was because actually you've got to be so gifted to, to make a career in science and what i realized i'd mistaken actually was a love of storytelling for a love of science and i have a love of both but what i really found i wanted to do was tell other people's stories 
um, like, um, like you, Martha, I got into the BBC soon after that, and um, I spent 10 years there, and it is a wonderful, wonderful apprenticeship there to learn how to tell stories, and I'm still doing it today. And do you want to give us your quick where you are right now? Well, yes, I've sort of got stuck in lunar orbit a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so I've just finished a children's book on, on all of the Apollo missions, which comes out uh, next month, called Where Once We Stood. Um, and I've written a big live show that's going to happen on the Mall here in Washington on the 19th and the 20th of July, outside the Air and Space Museum and up and down the Mall. We're just cutting the film at the moment as, as I speak. And um, if any of you can get a chance to come and see that, I really urge you to. It will be, in every sense of the word, awesome. <laughs> and I don't always use that word. <laughs> so we were talking earlier, you know, the natural history world or the natural world is not the same as it was 50 years ago, 10 years ago, even last year. And obviously, as this group well knows, you know, climate change is playing a huge role. So I'm curious how specifically our changing world and climate change has affected your filmmaking and storytelling when it comes to telling stories about our natural world. Martha, you want to start? Yeah, I think, I think somebody's invitational interest might be somebody else's turn off. Um, I think so it's horses for courses. You know, some programs you want to address it fully. Some programs you want to accept it but not lay any blame. Some programs, if you want another audience, just don't mention it at all. So I think it, it's very, you know, um, in Hostile Planet, which we made recently for Nat Geo, we, it was stated very much as a fact, but we weren't pointing any fingers. That the, the cause of, of climate change was never addressed. It was just, this is what the animals are facing now. So I just think it's horses for courses. I think it's who your audience is, who you're appealing to. You've got to bring people in. You don't want to turn them off. If they're interested, engage it with it. And if they're not, then do a different kind of programming. Chris? Well, this is something we really grappled with when we were uh, thrashing out, you know, what kind of beast One Strange Rock would be. Um, and, I, and I think there's, there's been a massive disconnect somehow between the storytellers and at least half the audience, those that still uh, perhaps come to these shows, that they appreciate the kind of riches of the natural world, but then they go and vote at the ballot box for the opposite. And our job is trying to bridge that gap, a chasm, if you like, actually, as it is these days. How do you do that? Is, is it something, is it a flaw in, in, in the stories and how we're constructing them? When we first started asking ourselves these questions for, for, for One Strange Rock, what we came up with together was an attempt to try and connect the lives and ecosystems of, of the animals that are featured in the series with the lives of those watching. In a way, a little bit like um, Pete Muller was talking about this morning, a sense of what home is and how these creatures' lives feed into our own lives absolutely and utterly directly. There's no disconnect with that. And that was why we ended up with this approach of using astronauts to connect us to it, to try and examine the world with this overview uh, perspective. But an overview perspective is a very difficult and an intangible um, inta thing to try and communicate. Most of us haven't flown above 60 miles or 100 kilometers above the atmosphere, and we don't really know what that feels like, however many times we're told. So our approach was to kind of connect these small, personal, often human stories. Our, our natural history sequences were often led by a human being um, with the next breath that you take, for example, in Gasp, um, connecting you to the diatoms, our heroes of that episode or the nitrogen cycle um, in the, uh, the salmon bringing the Pacific nitrogen to feed the forests around the Pacific Rim, um, which maintains the entire nitrogen cycle that keeps, keeps us alive, another of our crucial life support systems. That was our approach. Now, have we achieved anything that others haven't with that? I, I don't know that's for the audience to decide. There were certainly lots of people that came and watched it and said they liked it, and people that hadn't come to this kind of subject matter before. Will that translate actually to the sorts of wonderful projects that we've been hearing about this week here? I sincerely hope so, but um, we're still waiting to find out, I think. Vanessa? I think I, mean, I agree with everything you've both said. Um, my feeling is that we need to use our best 
storytelling skills and our best advocates for the natural world, which is our animal characters. And I think what we're trying to do on the America series that we're um, working with uh, for National Geographic um, is to use those heroes, those animal heroes, to convey the experience that they're going through today. So instead of looking at how their experiences would have been, it's to say this is the real world for animals today. And particularly in America, the animals that succeed here are incredible at um, reacting to opportunity. And that comes from living in a uniquely dynamic continent where change is an everyday process. Every day is a brave new world. So it's, it's actually a, a great way to build the changing environment into the storytelling and see it through the eyes of the animal characters. And I feel that that, you know, we just have to get cleverer and better at bringing the reality of our changing environment into our storytelling. So let's dive into some of the shows specifically that you all worked on for us. And I think I'm going to start with Hostile Planet. I think one of the things people don't realize is when we set out to do one of these shows, how long it takes. Hostile Planet, you shot over 1,800 hours of footage, 82 shoots, 1,300 days of filming. <laughs> You're tired just thinking about it. Um, I think some of you maybe have seen this trailer, but let's take a quick look at what was accomplished during those 1,300 days. I love that trailer. I think I have seen it maybe a hundred times. Our creative team did such a good job on that. And I think it touches on what I think sets this series apart, which is sort of the tone of the series. Could you talk a little bit about the tone of the series and the creative choices you made? Sure. So um, Nat Geo hadn't done a big blue chip natural history show for a while. And um, the BBC had been doing them and doing them very beautifully and it's all very lovely and we'll, on we go. <laughs> and that year wanted to set themselves apart and say we want to do this differently. And the brief was to make it different, raw, hostile, that's the term we came up with, um, visceral, granular truth. And rather than, not sugar-coated because that's a bit unfair and, and judgmental, but or pejorative, but um, anyway, so that was that's what we set out to do. So, so I know in the series you didn't shy away from difficult moments. I've watched it with numerous audiences, and there were moments where what do you mean? <laughs> where they would shriek um, <laughs> at watching. But you didn't you you didn't hesitate to keep the camera just locked on what was happening and sort of what was the decision behind that? Well, there's a lot of debate about it. Obviously, I mean, we wanted to tell the truth not only about climate change. Again, I said earlier, we didn't we didn't point any fingers, but this is the situation. And the critical thing for the animals is the world is changing and it's changing very fast. Animals do evolve, but they can't evolve quick enough to keep up with the climate change. So it's how are they doing? It's a sort of, it was a mark in the sand saying, how are these animals doing? And things are tougher and for them. And so the animals, some survive and thrive and do incredibly well, and others have a tougher time of it. We chosen not to pull back from the reality of how hard they're finding it 
and how hard they find it in a, rev in a normal year when things are lovely and wonderful and they're used to it all. But things aren't lovely and wonderful and used to it all. It is changing very fast. So we just wanted to be honest. Um, Technologically wise um, and storytelling wise, we very much wanted to be, Vanessa kind of touched on it, on the side of the animals. We wanted to be on the animal's shoulders. It's very easy in natural history and historically we used to do it where an animal would be over there and you'd have a long lens and you'd sit back and you'd watch the behavior unfold. I think audiences expect more now and we, needed the, we really wanted the audience to engage and feel that they were with the animal. So where we could, we'd have be with the animal. Um, rather than just watching it as if you were watching it through binoculars or something. And that's partly in the camera techniques we use, and it's partly in the words we use. So, we, some, you know, a word not say elephants do this, but it's almost like it's... it's so let me just think of an example. Um, uh, a lion might be thinking it's a hot day. <laughs> and rather than say, well, the temperature outside is whatever it is, 40 degrees centigrade, and the lions are feeling hot, you say, it's hot. Um, you know, shade is, is really welcome. That could be in the lion's head. It's very subtle, but you're saying the same thing and you're trying to be, experience it through the animal. So we were doing, obviously, we were working very hard on the script to make you feel you're embedded with the animals, all the camera shots to make you feel that, you know, traditionally you have a POV, but we tried to really embed the POV point of view shots with the, with the watching the animal shots. So it was, it was a lot of, lot of work that went into that. And then technology-wise, so, you know, for example, we used a racing drone very effectively um, particularly in two shows, one um, being a golden eagle flying over mountains and you know how our birds of prey stoop. So we had this racing drone literally fly unbelievably fast down these, these arets, these razor-edged um, edges of mountains and things. You really felt you were, you were with the golden eagle. And again, in the jungles program, we had this tiny little hummingbird being battered by drops of rain that kind of went, whoa, and off, off, off balance. And then we had the racing drone. I have to tell you this very funny story. But then it's a racing drone and flying through the forest um, as if it was a hummingbird. And, he, and at one point, we were trying to endlessly wipe the lens of that racing drone. And then you saw, actually, you know, the hummingbird is flying through this water. It wouldn't be perfect. So then we let bits of water stay on the lens, and suddenly it's a bit blurred. And the, you know what I mean? As if, and you do feel it's more visceral. But the, I just have to tell you this no, story. No, no, Very, very no, no. funny story. <laughs> so the guy who runs this, does this racing drone thing, he was doing it through, but not, you know, he can't see where his drone is going through the, the drone is going through the plants. So he's doing it all from camera on his headset. So he's, he's f literally flying with his eyes and he has a little control mechanism. He's amazingly good at it. But this little control panel has a little red light. And one of the hummingbirds, a hummingbird in the forest, thought, oh, that's a nice bright light. That will be a flower. I'll go and get some nectar. So this guy's blind to what's going on. And he's flying through the thing. And he's twiddling and twiddling. And this thing lands. He goes, ah, like this. <laughs> and of course, that, that, the drone then goes, whoa. And we, so his drone went flying off into the trees. He had no idea where it went because he threw the control panel away. Because <laughs> this tiny little hummingbird landed on his finger. <laughs> there, must be, anyway. there must be so few people in the world who actually have the skill to fly a drone like that. Yeah, very few. I mean, you really have to seek these people. And, and if you want to break into a new technology, you really have to get into the scientific world and find these people who are developing th these things, often for their scientific research, nothing to do with filmmaking. And then you try and adapt it for, for filmmaking. So one more quick question about Hostile Planet, and then we'll talk about something else. Is it, you know There was a little streaming service that dropped a natural history program at the same time as we launched Hostile Planet. It was beautiful, but it was very traditional. It had David Attenborough. You guys went with, yeah. <laughs> you, you went with Bear Grylls, which I thought was an interesting choice as far as his narration and his voice. And can you talk a little bit about that decision and how we, how we came to that idea? Yeah, Bear, Bear Grylls, um, like him or not like him, is a survivalist par excellence. And these animals are surviving, and they are resilient, and they're everything that Bear stands for. He stands for everything that they do day in, day out. And actually, he was kind of outside the natural history world and, and a bit of a surprise, but I think really, really fitted the show in terms of what these animals are trying to achieve. Getting Bear to narrate a natural history show <laughs> from a survival show was a really long journey. Um, and again, a fascinating one. So he kind of stood up for the first sentence and we just warmed him up a little bit and he said, and these bears, oh, you know, and we said, hang on a minute. <laughs> we just a little more gently and, and it took a long time. But anyway, we, I just said, my initial thing was Bear, just pretend you're reading to your children at night and you want them to go to sleep. I'm trying to get in from over here to over here. And, 
just soften the tone, deepen your voice, just relax, be really warm, and invite the audience in, invite your children into the story. So he kind of went there. And I'm still expecting him to get over here from over there. Anyway, we got there. And to do him credit, he worked really hard at it. And by the last few um, commentary records, which, I, which Kevin was at, he pretty much nailed it. I mean, we had to do retakes and retakes and retakes and retakes. But we weren't over here anymore at all. He, did, he worked so hard um, to get it as far over here as he could. So he was great. Yeah, good to work with. So live is obviously another, live television is obviously another storytelling approach that we take. And Plimsoll is actually working on a show that we're airing in two weeks called Yellowstone Live. Last August, we went live from Yellowstone for four nights, and we're doing it again starting June 23rd. So we'll take a quick look at a tape, and then I'm going to ask you a couple questions about that. It's four nights, 25 live cameras, a large number of remote cameras. How do you even begin to prepare for such a massive production? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the live specialist. Um, I, my role really on this is kind of guarding the, the wildlife in terms of the message and, and making sure that we get that right. Um, how do you do it? Well, it literally is baby steps. You have. I'm just basically going to walk you through this. You have a sheet of paper with five acts on it, and there are little bricks. And in those, it's one brick at a time. We want to start live, and we want to cut to Amazing Wildlife, and we want to see some scenery. And we, and we keep on thinking we have to see, think about the glory of Yellowstone, and we want some live. And we, you know what I mean? And there's, there's various elements that you're piecing in and you return to. And you literally fill out that wall of bricks with, we need to come back to that here and that there, and we'll round up the wildlife here. And, and you f literally fill it in like that. And we know the animal characters, the bears, the wolves, the eagles, and you need a taste of all of them, and you want a live animal in a studio. And it's, just, it's painting by numbers, because that sounds too simplistic, but it's building a wall brick, brick by brick when you know what those, each of those bricks is. But then when there's a bear coming over the ridge in Act 2 and you didn't know, have planned for that, you kind of throw that out the window a little bit to some extent too, don't you? Have to be, yeah, you have to be very nimble. And the chaos, the chaos that goes on in a live truck, I don't know if you've ever been witness to a live truck, but it's this massive truck <laughs> with a studio inside and everybody's talking at once. I mean, literally probably 30 people in there all talking at once to their microphones or to each other or something. And, it's comp and I, how anybody makes a program out of it, but again, that's not my role, so I'm fine about that. <laughs> but I think it's interesting, you know, because obviously... NFL, football live, but it's like a football field. You're talking Yellowstone, which is like thousands okay. of miles. So that's the other side of it. This is all pre-production I was talking about. The, the real thing is the, the knowledge, the technical knowledge of bouncing, hiring, you know, I'll hire a satellite for two hours here and three hours there. And we have teams all over. And between this hour and that hour, we've hired satellite time, as you do. And you bounce all their signal. They've been filming all day. And you get all their material up and back down to the truck. And then suddenly, the editors, the moment it all starts coming in, they're quickly packaging. And uh, this is what we filmed earlier. And they're making these little short things. So that's all happening in the build up to the live show. And then those cameras are also live in the live show. So we've had what we filmed earlier packages. 
and you have the live cameras going satellite and down, but I'm not technologically minded, so don't challenge me on this. <laughs> I, just, I just know it kind of goes up and down and out. <laughs> <laughs> I run, I run PR, that's about my knowledge too. <laughs> but sounds right. Um, let's shift for a minute to a more science-focused series, which is our series One Strange Rock, which we're incredibly proud of. Eight astronauts, six continents, 45 countries, and something I'd never seen in a science natural history series, a large portion of it from the International Space Station. Um, let's take a little look at One Strange Rock, and then Chris, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions. I'm going to tell you about the most incredible place. And you know what? You're walking on it. Our planet is literally bursting with life. life, life. There's so much activity, and our planet is right in the middle of it. I really wish that everyone could see the world the way that I've had a chance to see it. The strangest place in the whole universe might just be right here. So as the trailer shows, Darren Aronofsky was involved in the show. And for those that may not know who he is, he's the director of Black Swan and Mother. I mean, those are some trippy ass movies. <laughs> <laughs> what was the sensibility and what did he bring to this series? Because he'd never done a television series before like this. No, no, you're right, he hadn't. I mean, I think what, what was clever about Jane Root, our CEO at Utopia's idea, was in, in approaching him to help us with the storytelling was, it plays back to what I was saying earlier about this challenge we had of weaving stories together in a way that just made you sit up and look and think, wow, I've not seen anything like this before. Just in an attempt to reach out to an audience that perhaps hadn't, en perhaps hadn't engaged with it before. Um, so I think bringing him on board, and that happened before I was involved, was, was, was really smart because he and his writing and co-producing partner, Ari Handel, who's got a PhD in neuroscience and great science background as well, um, proved to be really instrumental in helping all the producer directors shape their stories. Um, and they've, they've really wallowed themselves in some of these big ideas and these deep philosophical feelings about the cycles of life and death that keep and maintain the planet's sort of fragile biosphere. Um, and they were all themes that we wanted to include, but not obviously overtly kind of bash viewers over the head with. So we needed some way of engaging on a very human level these subjects and connecting people to them that way and letting them make their own connections and their own minds up, I suppose. Um, but by showing them, as I said before, I think, about how these deep connections between these small moments um, in, in, a, in a few hours on, on Earth transfer and translate into their own lives utterly directly. So, yeah, he was a useful partner. And right from the start, um, they were involved, the two of them, particularly Ari, in, in the script meetings with us and helping us weave our beat sheets together and re-re-rewriting them. I think I wrote 36 versions of my script before we went out shooting. That was uh, quite a lesson. I mean, it was like being at film school for a year. <laughs> um, a lot of people would pay a lot of money for that. <laughs> well, yes. Yes, the master classes were great. I learned a lot making this series, and it was one wonderful two years. You talked about this earlier, um, but maybe we just touch on it quickly, which is the, uh, using the astronauts as our storytellers, which was sort of a unique way in. Nicole Stott, uh, if you all were here yesterday, she was actually on our opening panel, who was a big part of the series. Talk about the astronauts as storytellers. 
Yeah, so I think actually, Vanessa, you were involved early on, before, again, before I joined with the initial discussions with Darren about how to frame the series. I mean, you might want to say something a bit about the astronauts initially. Yes, it was, uh, I was invited out by Jane to uh, spend a week with Darren and his team, uh, which was an amazing experience. As you say, lots of film students would pay, <laughs> give their hind teeth for that. Yeah. And um, at that stage, they'd done huge amounts of research on the science, and it was incredible body of work to take that much. You know, they're very complicated ideas and distill them down. But um, Jane had said to me, I don't know what you're going to bring to this, but you might have an idea or something, um, just see what happens. And I was absolutely terrified, you know, partly in awe of Darren Aronofsky and not quite sure what I was doing in the room. Um, and I sort of stayed up all night thinking there's something wrong. It needs a kind of framing for this series. It needs a point of view. And that's when I was looking at actually through my love of David Bowie, who I've often returned to, and Chris Hadfield um, and Spiders, you know, because he sang in space. Um, I suddenly thought it has to be through the astronauts' point of view for the overview effect. And everybody um, loved it, I think, as an idea. That you immediately got it, I think, as a, as a, as a sort of format. But it's, it's one thing to have that idea and quite another thing to translate it into kind of eight really compelling astronaut personal stories that interweave with those of the planetary science. And that was a real challenge. Um, and I, I made a film with the Apollo astronauts a few years ago in the shadow of the moon and was well aware that with the right preparation and casting, you, you can find and tease out the most wonderful um, personal stories from these characters. So we spent some months casting to, to find the eight perfect hosts um, that we ended up with. And I think Eloisa Noble, producer, Eloisa and I looked at a hundred initially, a hundred astronauts we screen tested. And we distilled it slowly over the course of several months down to those eight of which Chris Hadfield was, was very, very much at the top of our list from, from, from very early on, given his communication skills. And then we worked very closely with them over those coming months to absolutely deep, deeply weave their stories in with our stories. And they had to be believable. As characters, you absolutely had to believe that they weren't just sort of telling you stuff. And the great, wonderful thing about you know, almost 60 years of human spaceflight now is that you've got a pool of 550 people who've flown into space, all with different backgrounds in science, and technology, and medicine, and the arts sometimes as well. And, and they all brought something to the science show by fine-tuning our selection to, to the episodes that way. They were a fascinating group. I have to say, we, we did a press event where we had all eight astronauts on a stage with 200 television journalists who half the time could give a shit about anything. And they <laughs> literally all stopped and paid, they were solely focused on these eight astronauts. And they see celebrities all the time. And these, these eight astronauts stopped them in their tracks. And it was fascinating. So for season two, which I'm excited, if you don't know, we are hard at work on pre-production for season two. Our storytellers are actually going to be explorers, which we're super excited about. And we're in the process of talking to a lot of people now and figuring that out, which I think is going to be really bring a whole different perspective uh, to the series. So I want to touch on something you mentioned, which is point of view, uh, which brings us to the series that we just announced a month ago, I think, called Queens. And I think we have a slide for that because we have no footage. We haven't even started shooting yet. But tell us a little bit about Queens, because I'm super, super excited about this show. I'm so excited to be doing this show. And it came about in a really interesting way. Um, for a long time, and my background's a combination of anthropology and biology, so I've been very lucky to spend time with uh, indigenous peoples around the world. Um, I was often documenting what the males were doing, and, and particularly rites of passage and all the kind of sexy stuff of guys having their heads shaved and going through dramatic rituals with bullet ants and things like that. But it was often what the women were up to that would intrigue me, and the sort of the, the power play that would be going on. And as I then transitioned into more uh, natural history filming work, the same thing was playing out. So um, I spent time in Gombe with the Gombe chimps. And again, there's lots of kind of shouting and screaming with what the males are doing. But as you dug into the depth of the studies that are going, in, are going on there with people like Bill Wallower, obviously under Jane Goodall's auspices, um, you realize the kind of complexity of the female 
uh, alliances and leadership and actually how think they're actually calling the shots. Um, so this was, again, happened with gelada baboons. And recently, I've been working uh, for two years in, in Africa filming elephants. And extraordinary behaviors amongst the matriarchs, not all of it cuddly. For example, we saw a rival herd coming into a waterhole, and we've been documenting um, uh, the, the particular herd in front of us, and suddenly the atmosphere changed, and it was war. And these females came in, and they were like, ears flapping, and they rushed forward and took a new calf away from our matriarch. And it, you know, just as dramatic as any kind of males in must that you might have seen. They were full on battling to get this calf back. Our matriarch went in and got her calf back. And it was incredibly dramatic. And then at another turn, you'd see extraordinary tender behaviors from our matriarch where she would, um, you know, rescued a stuck baby that wasn't even hers from certain death. So. I've become more and more intrigued in, in sort of looking at what the females within animal societies are doing. In this series, we're, we're taking the kind of female-led animal societies, matriarchal societies or matrilineal societies, and we're looking at how females compete, rise to power, hold on to power, and then what happens when they lose power. Why do you think this series has never been made before? It's kind of mind-boggling, actually, when you think about it. Maybe I think not. It, I think it starts with Darwin. <laughs> yeah. Genius that he is. Um, I think the you know the centerpiece of Darwin's theory is obviously sexual selection, and it was very much slanted towards the way males compete for females. And that again, it's it's quite easy to document and to see because it's dramatic, it's heads butting, um, and I think that has skewed science and in turn a lot of our filmmaking. So if to really look at what the females are doing, you need to spend a lot of time. You need to recognise individuals and follow how the relationships develop. And you know this this story actually developed out of a relationship that I have been developing with Janet Hanvistering, where we've been talking about this subject matter and both of us feeling there was something there. And I had a smaller idea, which was night queens, which was to look at the kind of battles between lionesses and hyenas on the savannas at night. And I said to Janet, you know, I think, I think there's something here. And she went, in classic American style, we need to supersize this. <laughs> Let's go big. Let's do the six-parter on queens of the animal kingdom. So the, the queen's idea isn't just going to be what we see on screen, but it's going to manifest itself largely behind the scenes as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, to, it's great today to be sitting here with another Matriarch. <laughs> hope you're not. <laughs> hope you're not offended by that. But um, <laughs> war. That's got our, yeah, our ears going. Ears clapping. But but actually, there aren't many female leaders in natural history filmmaking. Um, it's. I looked around in the sort of when I was developing and learning my skills, and there weren't many women amongst us. Um, so. I think it's important to try and get more voices into our industry. And it's not just about female voices. Um, we're trying to get, we're really trying to get indigenous voices from the cultures in the countries where we film, because these are the voices we need to hear. As Steve Boys was saying earlier, they are the guardians of biodiversity. So the, we very much have a bigger mission for this series so that we, in, incorporate more types of people into the, the production team and work with more types of scientists and field assistants so that we increase that diversity. Well, I know the reaction when we announced that series, both internally and within the community, was just incredible excitement. So I know it, maybe we'll have you back in like two years once we have something to show, something to show and we can yeah. share it with everyone. <laughs> so I just want to end on one last question for you all because we're out of time. <coughs> And I said I'd try to be finished on time. I didn't promise. Um, <laughs> um, is answer for me in a in a tweet type sentence. If you guys could make any natural history series you wanted, what would it be? And then Courtney Monroe, our president, will pick the best one backstage and fund it. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but Chris. Okay, well, I, I guess for me, being a planetary scientist, it, it would be perhaps the first documentary about the extremophiles um, in the depths of the Martian basins. So fund that. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm too competitive. I'm not going to give away my secrets. <laughs> Actually, I'm a marine biologist, so I still feel there's an awful lot to be done, done um, in the oceans that we haven't. You know, I think that ta uh, Blue Planet and Blue Planet 2 were fantastic, but I think for a certain audience they were, and I think there's a lot more we could do in the oceans that will um, bring a lot more people to, to, to the marine world and the importance of it. Vanessa? I'd like to develop the first game that um, takes on the environment and evolutionary theory. So Fortnite. So take the storytelling tell into the space where kids are obsessed. Um, so that's, that's on my bucket list. Well, that's a different department. So now we can fund two things, right? <laughs> um, we the work you guys do and the time you spend and the patience you have to deliver these amazing stories to our audiences all over the world. We're incredibly lucky to have you all working with us. And I just want to thank you all for, I couldn't find any American panelists. So thank you all for flying across the pond uh, to join us today. We really, really, really appreciate it. And again, we are so honored to be able to showcase the incredible work you guys do. So thank you so much and thank all of you. We just walk off this way. <laughs> Thank you. Vanessa, Martha, Chris. Well, now you know some of the faces behind these spectacular programs going on across the world. Now, our next group of speakers will highlight solutions to biodiversity loss and the different ways rewilding can be used in conservation work. Please welcome Founder and Managing Director of the American Prairie Reserve and National Geographic Explorer, Sean Garrity. Chief Marketing Officer for African Parks, Andrea Hedloff. And Founder, Ex